Thank you all for joining again. Um, tonight, uh, we have a very special guest, Luca Palmieri. Uh, he's very famous. He's, <laughs> I guess, one of the most famous uh, speakers that we, we have uh, we've had in Rust Dublin. Uh, and he today he is going to give us a talk about uh, a very special, very important topic, uh, testing and basically black box testing for Rust microservices, as you can see on the on the title. Uh, and with that, I give the floor to Luca. Tonight we're going to be talking about black box testing for Rust microservices. Um, there's going to be a piece which is largely Rust independent, and then we're going to go a little bit into more the Rust bits and pieces, in particular on Wiremock. For those of you I haven't met before, my name is Luca Palmieri. I'm a lead engineer at TrueLayer. That's what I do for a salary. Outside of my day job, I am mostly known in the Rust community for things I've been doing around open source and Rust projects. I am one of the co-organizers of the Rust London user group. So in particular, I look, for, I look after the um, code dojos and the hack and learns. I maintain and contribute um, to a bunch of different open source projects, um, in particular, Cargo Chef, Warmock, which we're gonna be discussing tonight, um, Lympha, and the rest that's done a bunch of different things over time. And I'm currently writing Zero to Production Rust. Zero to Production Rust is a book about using the language to do something, not a book about learning the language. In particular, it's a book of it's a book about using Rust to do backend services. So some of the themes in the book do overlap with some of the things we've been discussing tonight. And you can follow the links if you want to know more about any of those things. Getting to the bit of it, um, this evening presentation is divided into three sections, more or less. The first one, we're going to go into the different types of tests that we can perform and why do we test to what extent like what are we trying to gain and what does each category of tests give us in terms of assurance then we're going to look specifically at the topic of testing when it comes to microservices so the specific type of challenges that black box testing encounters when dealing with microservice architectures and finally I'm going to show you um, a little bit of a taste of why mock RS, which is one library to do HTTP mocking, uh, which I ported from the original uh, word mock from Java. It can be used to use this type of this type of techniques on Rust projects. You might be seeing me drinking tonight a lot. Said that, unique tests versus black box tests. So let's start by having a look a little bit at a very, very, very um, simplified schema of what an application looks like. Um, generally speaking, whatever we're doing doesn't really matter too much the domain or the purpose. We have some level of domain or business logic, uh, which we want to open up to somebody else. And so to do so, we uh, put forward an interface. Very commonly these days, that interface is an API. So some kind of REST API or gRPC API exposed over the wire. So something that people can talk to using HTTP. But there's also other types of interfaces which we are equally familiar with. So it could be a message consumer that is getting messages off a queue. It could be a command line interface, which we interact on the command line. It could be a UI, which usually we talk to an API underneath. It doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is there's a kernel of logic, which is protected by an external interface. And using that logic is what the user wants to do. So they're going to talk to our API to book a table, for example, for a restaurant. They're going to talk to our API to buy a stock. Uh, they're going to talk to our API to create an event on a calendar. Different types of actions, the mechanics is always the same. External interface, I talk to the external interface. The external interface does some marshalling, some decoding, some validation, and then gives me access to some functionality which is instead underneath. When we are writing applications which are fairly complex, uh, we generally want to verify that they work as expected. And that's a little bit where testing comes into the picture. The way we usually test applications, um, or the way people usually start 
testing applications is by bringing in a lot of unit tests. And many of you might be familiar with the so-called pyramid of testing, which basically says you need to have a lot of unit tests, a little bit less of component tests and or black box tests, but I'll chat about those in a second. And then you might have some end-to-end -end tests running in your cluster, exercising the whole flow. And that is true. Um, but to an extent, it's also based around assumptions that might have changed uh, given the new technologies and given the way we work these days. What's the issue? So what's, what does unit testing give us? The idea is that the domain or business logic within the application is the most complex part. It's the part of the application where a lot of the subtler bugs are going to be hiding. And so what we do is we bypass the external interface uh, because it's a little bit cumbersome to interact with an API, for example, in a test suite. So we go straight into the domain. Um, that domain will have dependencies over other bits and pieces in the application. Uh, those dependencies we mock and we just exercise one unit. And that is a lot of pros. Um, for example, it allows us very often to get very thorough coverage. So we get a very, very good uh, coverage of all the possible code paths going inside the piece of logic, which is a positive thing. And usually also unit tests are fairly fast to run. So you're not gonna wait a lot on a unit test suite to complete, assuming you've written your unit test as unit tests. Then I'm gonna do a lot of IO, um, all things are gonna be sketched out or mocked. The issue though is seldomly discussed and it's the other face of the coin. The other face of the coin is that tests on their own do not guarantee that the software is correct. And this is seldomly discussed, uh, but it's worth repeating again and again and again. Tests do not give us this strong property. If we want guarantees that a piece of software is correct, there are other types of methodologies that we can use. Formal methods, for example, are one of the possible ways we can get into it. Tests are useful, but they give us something which is much, much weaker. What we get from tests is that the software is correct in the very, very same scenarios we have exercised inside the test sheets. If we exercise the same scenarios in a production environment, then we have high confidence that they're gonna be the same. But if we go back to the schema, that's not the way the software is used in a production environment. Nobody bypasses the API to talk to your domain layer. Nobody mocks out uh, the other bits and pieces of your application uh, when they're actually asking you to perform an action. The way they use your software is more or less like this. They go through the API, the API, the API does certain bits of logic that calls into the domain. The domain does other bits of logic and calls into other parts of your application. So if we want to get high confidence, we need to test in the same way the user is actually using our API. Because then we have alignment between the testing behavior and the user behavior. They are the same and we get high confidence that it's correct. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as it sounds. There's gonna be some complications and we're gonna chat about those in a second. But on the flip side, we actually get a lot because once we start interacting with our application from the API, we can actually disregard entirely what's happening below the API. We don't care anymore about what the implementation looks like. We only care about the contract. If the contract stays the same and it produces the same type of responses or the same type of side effects, which is something we're gonna discuss more in a second, then for all intents and purposes, our test logic doesn't change. What this means, and that's also why they're called black box tests, is because we don't care what's inside the box. We only care about the interface of the box. Uh, the internals, they, they don't matter. It means, for example, that the testing logic could be written in something else. It could be written in Python, even if the application is within Rust, and it would still work. And if you take this to the extreme, it means that if, when you have a black box test, oh, why are you not going to the right? Perfect. You are free to refactor. So you know that your application behaves properly, your contract doesn't change. You can go inside, change the internals, refactor to the better understanding of the model that you now have after having run the application for a while. And you get high confidence that nothing has been broken because the tests have not been touched throughout the process. This is not the same you get when you usually do unit testing. 
because unit testing is intrinsically more linked to the implementation details because it's piercing through the layer of abstractions. What that means is that when you're refactoring substantially the way your application is written, you will have to refactor the tests while you're refactoring the code. And it's very easy when both are changing uh, to introduce bugs or to fail to check certain code paths that were actually checked before. And that paves the way for bugs to creep in into the future. Uh, in particular, if you have black box tests and those black box tests are actually comprehensive, that de risks a lot of things we generally are advised against, like rewrites. Now, you can't rewrite because you will never know if the new one is going to be the same. You have a black box test suite, you can do a rewrite. If that covers all the behavior and the tests are happy, then you are fairly confident that it's going to work. So, a lot of value into black box tests in general. Let's talk a little bit more about the downsides. And to talk about the downsides, we need to go and look about, look, go and look specifically into microservices. Why microservices? For a few reasons. It is in many ways, uh, whether we like it or not, it's kind of a separate conversation. It's the paradigm that is being used today is to be a software uh, of a certain scale. And it's also the type of paradigm which proves particularly difficult while you're trying to do black box testing. And we're gonna see why in a second. So this is a slide I use actually probably a bit too often these days, uh, but I like it because it gives you a strong impression of what it looks like. This is a snapshot coming from a talk uh, made by Monzo. Monzo is a UK challenger bank for those of you who haven't heard the name before. And this is their production environment. And as the article title says in the bottom right, they have something along the lines of 1,600, 1,700 different microservices. So each dot in that plot is a microservice. And each blue line connecting two dots, um, that's a microservice talking to another microservice over the network. And as you can see, it's fairly intricate. Like, that's a lot of complexity going on there. And as in a typical microservice architecture, we can easily imagine that when you receive a request at the edge of the Monzo infrastructure, then multiple microservices will have to cooperate and be orchestrated to produce the result that the user wants. And how does that translate when we're talking about testing? So of course, end-to-end -end testing, so checking how multiple microservices talk to each other, something you would do inside the cluster. How does that um, translate itself for black box testing of a single component? Well, let's zoom out, right? So let's look again at the same diagram we were looking at before, uh, but let's put it into context now. The application, our service, does not exist in isolation. Those boxes on the bottom that before we had just like briefly sketched out are usually adapter layers. So there are ways for the application to go and interface with other applications running inside the cluster. Uh, might be other apps. So in this case, in this example, I think I have an email server, or there might be infrastructure pieces and components. Uh, so there might be a database of some kind, like a Postgres or a MySQL. Uh, there might be a message broker, which might be Kafka or RabbitMQ. The application receives a request, does some processing, um, stores some data, tells other services to do some other stuff. Now, this of course is challenging once you are starting to test the application. So we said before that we don't wanna touch anything inside the violet square box. And the reason we don't wanna do that is because that compromises our um, faith in the relevance of the tests. Because we're touching the code and we're making the code behave in a way which is not the same it behaves in production. So how can we test talking to the API? So keep testing from the outside without having to spin up the email server, for example. Because the email server probably is not a leaf in the microservice architecture. The email server might talk to other services. And before you know it, they're probably not spinning up the whole mess, but you're spinning up a sizable chunk of it, uh, which makes your tests much more complicated. They take much longer and generally that's not feasible in a sufficiently complicated architecture. So what you wanna do is you want to do some mocking. Specifically, what you wanna do is you wanna mock the third-party dependencies. 
So you want to mock the services that you talk to. Uh, the private dependencies, you can spin up in CI. Um, so for example, databases in microservice architectures, they're usually not shared. So data stored is used exclusively by the microservice that owns that data. That you can bring up in CI using Docker. So you can bring up a Docker uh, or Postgres, and then you can use very easily. Message broker, same thing. You can spin up uh, a Kafka in a Docker container and talk to that Kafka. So that allows you, for example, to test extensively your persistence layer. But the email server, we can mock. But the important detail, once again, that mocking is outside the boundaries of the application. We're not touching the application to introduce mocking code. We are configuring the application to talk to another email server, which we control. So we're telling the application, well, instead of going to uh, email.mycompany.com, go and talk to the email server on localhost 1234. But the behavior is exactly the same. So the application, when it needs to send an email, is actually going to make an HTTP request to the email server saying, send this email. Which, of course, begs the question is like, OK, how are we going to do it? Like, how are we going to? intercept that request. So are we going to make sure that the flow works? And that's where Wildmock comes into place. Uh, Wildmock is a library that I ported to Rust, um, but the original one was written for Java, which I haven't personally used. Uh, first hand, I used the .NET port. So Wildmock RS is a portable port in a way. And the name kind of implies the function. So we're doing mocking on the wire. So we're not doing mocking inside the application, but we are doing it by intercepting the communication that goes over the network. And the way it works, if you look at it um, from a user perspective, so from a developer perspective, actually, to be precise, it's fairly simple. We start a mock server, and that's the first line. Oh, let me see if I can get a pointer, which makes things, makes me feel much fancier, and it makes things easier for you. So uh, first line, let mock server equal um, that, basically, oops, did a mess, sorry. That creates a new HTTP server. This is a real HTTP server running on a separate thread, uh, accepting requests on a certain port. The port is randomly allocated by the operating system, so it doesn't conflict with anything else you're running. And that server, after you wait the start call, it's running, it's there, you can talk to it. And by default, it's gonna return 404s, no matter what you ask, because it has no behavior. At that point, you can choose to add behavior to the mock server. And that's what all this like what mock mock piece is doing. So a mock is basically a scenario. You're telling the mock server, if you receive a request which matches a certain number of parameters, then you're gonna respond in this specific way. In this case, we're telling the mock server, if I receive a request, which is method get, and use it the hello endpoint, then you're going to return a 200 with no body. Uh, where mock supports a variety of different matching logic. So you can match on the body schema, you can match on the body contents, you can match on the headers, you can match on the query parameters, uh, kind of sky's the limit. And you can respond in different ways. So the response can include headers, can include a body, can use pieces of the request, for example. So it allows you to do some fairly flexible stuff without, of course, the whole complexity of a whole web server. So you're not allowed to do very custom things uh, because that's usually not necessary. Because what you want to test is, oh, if the email, the email dispatch succeeds, then my API works. If the email dispatch server is down and returns a 503, then my API does this other thing. If the email dispatch server doesn't respond, uh, then I expect my API to retry and similar things. And the line here, mount, that's where we're actually mounting the behavior on the mock server. So that's when we're telling the mock server, from this point onwards, you got to behave this way. And then the last part is that we're actually testing that behavior. So we're getting SERP. SERP is a Rust HTTP client. And we're actually making a request. So we're making an HTTP request on the path hello with a get and the server responds with a 200. Now, if the fact that that server is running on localhost doesn't matter. Like, it could be running anywhere. But the good thing is now, in another test, what we can do is instead of doing a direct HTTP call, we can spin up our API. 
and we can sub set up on the mock server the behavior we expect to see on the API when it interacts with the email server. And so we can test the different scenarios. So going back to what we were looking at before, mock server allows you to do this mocking outside of the application boundary, which basically means you configure your app and then it runs exactly as is. Now, there's a variety of things you can do. And I think I want to just point the attention to two things which I found particularly important. The first one is that you can also check expectations. So you can tell the mock server not only to behave in a certain way, but you can also tell the mock server to verify that certain requests have taken place. Uh, and the mock server, when it goes out of scope, so when it's dropped for the Rust people in the audience, uh, then it's going to check all the assertions and verify that they actually happened. So in this case, we're telling the mock server, expect to receive at least one GET request on the path alone. So one or more, that's what that one dot not stands for. If it doesn't, at the end of the test, it's going to panic. And that's going to make the test fail. And this is one way also, once again, at looking at um, testing applications. So once you're testing for the outs from the outside, so you're not actually um, interacting with internals, you're only interested into testing observable, be observable behavior. So behavior that you can detect by interacting with the system. And in applications such as APIs, there's usually three types of behavior you want to test. The simplest one is testing the response of the API. So I'm giving you some input to do some work, and you're giving, back, giving me back a response. And I'm going to check that the response is what I expect. So I'm going to check that the status code is correct. I'm going to check um, that the body contains certain types of fields, which I expect. The second type of behavior we want to test, which is observable, is side effects related to state or triggering actions in other systems. So that might be checking that something has been stored into the database, checking that an API call, as in this case, has been made to another system. So for example, if I have um, a booking system when I'm booking a table, and part of the, of the business logic is once you book the table, you're actually going to have an event into the calendar uh, reminding you that you need to go there at that point in time. Then I need to test that we're actually calling the calendar service. So that's part of the observable behavior that I need to ensure it actually happens. And the third type of tests, which we're not going to cover tonight, is instead checking for telemetry data. So checking that when a certain type of failure happens, not only the system behaves in a certain way, but it also logs a certain error message or that it also increments a certain Prometheus metric. Because those telem that telemetry data is the one you're actually going to use to operate the service in a production environment. So you've got to be sure that it's there. Because if you don't test it, you then it might not be there when you need it. And that can be fairly ugly. Said that, the last thing I want to um, kind of stress tonight is that this looks like a lot of work. Uh, especially if you are arriving into a new company or an existing company and you are working with a code base that doesn't have any kind of black box tests. So you go there and you're like, okay, I want to do this thing. It looks very cool, super useful. But then you're like, you have the writer block. I'm like, okay, how do I get this? How do I get that in there? And the reason is also that complex applications usually don't look this nice. They don't have a database, a message broken, an email server. Uh, they have 10, 15, 20 different dependencies. And more often than not, you don't really know what dependencies are called to do what. And that makes it tricky to write these tests because you don't know exactly what behavior you need. But you can flip this around. So the other thing you can do, and this is something we implemented in Wiremock fairly recently, so I think two weeks ago, roughly, you can also use Wiremock to explore the code base you're working on. So what you can do is you can spin up a mock server uh, using a, basically without mounting any behavior, so to say. Then you can uh, probe your application. So ask your application, uh, make a request or like probe it in any way to trigger some behavior. And then check on the mock server what kind of requests have actually been sent. 
And so that's a way for you to actually understand the application as you test it. And if, you, if it panics, it's going to give you basically a dump of all the requests that they see it. And then from there, you can say, OK, if I try to make a booking, that's going to call the calendar service. Um, so I need to set up some behavior there. Well, actually, it also calls, for example, the authentication system, because it needs to authenticate before it can talk to Google Calendar API. And that allows you to build an understanding of the code base in a very safe manner. Because the other way of doing it would be to go in production and try in prod, or go in prod and like kind of dig around. It's not a lot of fun. Sometimes it's not easy and can be fairly risky. It's that you can do all these experiments from the very safe and cuddly place of your test um, suit. Just not too bad. It's a valuable thing to have um, in your toolkit, so to say. Said that, let's recap <clears throat> a little bit what we discussed today, tonight. Even if you forget like 99, not 9% of the things I've said, um, not all of them are particularly interesting. Uh, there's three things uh, which I think you should bring on with you and they might be useful if you're trying to do um, something along these lines going forward. Number one, and it's truth number zero um, in the way I work, the more your tests resemble the actual usage of your product, the more they mimic the behavior of your users, the more useful they are. Uh, so if you have any way to keep closer to how the user behaves, go for it. Second one is that black box tests not only ensure you that the software is correct, they also buy you technical leverage. They allow you to perform refactoring in a very safe environment without having to fear breakages in the behavior of the application. And number three is that using wire mock and similar techniques, then you're still able to get the mocking behavior you want without compromising um, the faithfulness of your tests. So you put all the mocking outside the boundary of the application and it allows you to be confident the application you're testing is the application you're gonna run in a production environment. Said that, um, mandatory message we're hiring Rust engineers, uh, many Rust engineers at this point. Um, we have an office in Milan, we're hiring there. We have an office in London, we're hiring there. We actually have an office in Dublin. Uh, we're not hiring engineers there, but we might be able to have a conversation if that's something that uh, it's interesting to you. And all these Rust people are working on our core banking project. So they're working on our payments infrastructure for us to do payments over faster payments, SEPA, and other rails across Europe and beyond. If you're interested, just give me a shout. Uh, I'm happy to have a conversation. If you are convinced that it's the future, uh, go and apply directly. And said that, um, that is all for tonight. I hope I haven't been too boring or too long. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those now. This is great. Um, so did you did you have something that you wrote this for? Or did you just decide to write it because you'd used it before and it was a good thing on .NET? Did you have a project in mind that you use it on? Uh, I use this everywhere at this point. So black box testing is the number one way I generally approach uh, API projects. So when in layer roughly a year and a half ago, we started to write production APIs using Rust. This was one of the first things uh, I needed that was not properly there. So at that point in time, the only project in the Rust ecosystem which allowed you to do um, while mocking was Mokito. Uh, but Mokito has a couple of limitations which didn't make it very suitable for my use case. Now, the first one is that you only have one mock server. Uh, as I said, my APIs don't usually have a single dependency. So they have more than one, so that couldn't work. The second one is that Mokito required you to mess around with compiler flags, uh, which is, I think, I deeply dislike. Um, I don't like to touch application code with test code as much as possible. Um, so I said, well, this looks something I need. So I tried writing it. Um, and the wild mock one from .NET was very useful. Um, so I just took that as inspiration, rolled with it. And then the APIs diverged, of course, because what's like idiomatic in Rust is not idiomatic in .NET and vice versa. Um, but yeah, it very much stands from a niche. And I mean, there's going to be other tools like this coming out probably in the next few months uh, that we're going to be open sourcing, feeling similar needs within the ecosystem that we found while we were actually running uh, production workloads. 
I have a question. Is the transport for your API kind of configurable? Can you, for instance, make it a gRPC uh, to mock a gRPC server or something like that? No. Um, that's something we want to do. Um, so I think I'm going to mock gRPC. But it's not... How do I say that? I don't think you want something that does both REST and gRPC uh, because then you get kind of a of an API, which is the intersection of the two, which is actually not much and is not ergonomic for either. Um, for gRPC, there is a way to make a very nice API. And so something that is easy to use. But at the moment, the bindings you get, uh, if you're using Prost, if you're using Tonic, don't allow you to do a lot programmatically. Um, so a piece that we've been pushing out for a while, but at a certain point we pick up, um, is looking into how we can do that in such a way that basically, if you go back here, I'll tell you in a nutshell how we envision this to happen. You start a mock server, pretty much, and you tell the mock server which gRPC services you want to mock. And that can easily be done because in Rust, they are traits. So there's kind of some generic parameters. You say, okay, I want to spin up a gRPC mock server for A, B, C, D. And then you should be able here to build the mock as in given request arriving on this RPC method. And then the matcher should have access to the struct of that RPC method so that you can make structured assumptions. You respond with this body, which you can pass in, uh, and it's one type of the response type. And you have things which are tailored to GPC. So you have the GPC status codes, um, support for streaming of different kinds, and so on and so forth. It's on my mind, um, as you've seen, spent some time thinking about it. Um, it's just trickier than it looks um, at this point in time. But if somebody wants to do it, I'm happy to use it. <laughs> Thanks. Luca, very interesting. Thanks for the, uh, yeah, all the uh, sort of information on unit tests and stuff. Um, we kind of run into the same issues in terms of volatility and so on, refactoring. <clears throat> we tend to find that they don't survive the refactoring very well and you'll end up redoing all the work again. So yeah, this very much fits into the way we think about things. Um, I also really like the, the probing using a kind of mock server there. Like you're actually exploring what API calls are being made and so on and actually setting up a server to essentially watch your application and seeing what it's doing. The thing I was wondering about can you set up the mock so that it actually proxies through to an existing server? So it's almost a man in the middle that intercepts and you can almost sit and log what you're doing. I don't know if that's something you've thought about doing so, or if it does that already. No, it doesn't do that already. Um, the reason I haven't gone in that direction is that, how do I say? kind of goes in a slightly separate design space. Um, and that's where, for example, the original word mock is extremely good. Um, because when you start wanting it to be able like a proxy, um, then you usually want also to start running it as a standalone binary, for example. That's often like the two requirements go end in end, 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 end. And it felt like there was not a lot to add. Uh, like, making it in Rust wouldn't have added anything that was not currently already available. Um, so the original wire mock should work fairly well. Running it in Rust was convenient when you're running Rust tests. So in that case, it uh, feels a little bit more useful. But having a proxy um, is something that I'm exploring for slightly different use case. Uh, in particular, it's to test failure modes. At the moment, wire mock allows you to test a lot of failure modes, which are at the HTTP layer, so to say. So return me an error code. Um, take a little bit longer if you want to send me a response. What I would like to be able to test, and that's particularly valuable um, for certain types of applications, is what happens when you have network layer issues, uh, packet drops, um, response being malformed, um, the server hanging out on you, uh, the server never actually responding to you. So keeping the connection open forever and so on and so forth. So, and it's in a way very similar to an application that exists in the Ruby ecosystem called ToxyProxy uh, from Shopify. Um, so that's on my list of things I'd like to port. 
uh, and then two combines with wild mock, then we could also start thinking about proxying. Um, but there's a project that you can use if you want to do that in Rust today. It's called StarBares. Um, it uses wild mock underneath, um, and it's fully compatible with the wild mock Java API, like the HTTP one. So you can achieve that proxying today if you want to. Uh, the, pro the project is linked in the readme of WebMock. So if you go check the library, uh, you'll find the record of that. Super, thank you. That's really interesting. I'm going to go and have a look at that. Uh, you said Mockito, but there's also HTTP mock. Yep. But uh, I think that arrived later. Yeah. Or was uh, less famous at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any, uh, what are the advantages over HTTP mock? So at this point in time, I think the feature set is fairly similar, uh, I'll be very honest. Like between, there's HTTP mock and there's also another one called uh, HTTP test. And when I started, uh, there was a comparison matrix in the wild mock um, readme saying, okay, we have this, 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 they have this, but not that, uh, they have this. And the nice thing is that it's been a little bit of healthy competition. <laughs> so actually now most of the libraries do everything. Um, so it's more around the type of APIs that you prefer and what it looks like and how it feels. So honestly, it depends on your taste. They're all equally well done. Um, they're all good. Thank you. I'm hoping to add HTTPS support, which would be a differentiating feature, which at the moment doesn't exist. So yeah. there's, there's no way to spin up an HTTPS mock server. Um, but I'm sure that once I add it, somebody else will add it. And that's good because it means the ecosystem advances together. So it's better for everybody. Yeah. Just nobody wants to mess with certificates. <laughs> yeah. well, it's also very hard to implement that layer. Yeah, I would say it's unnecessarily hard. Um, yeah. I mean, you're not re-implementing TLS, right? You're using TLS libraries that already exist. It's just that TLS is always tricky to get right in a way. Right. Uh, are there any other questions for the speaker? And uh, <clears throat> uh, hello, I have a question. Uh, it's uh, really interesting, this, uh, this uh, library. Uh, of course, in the microservice world, uh, not everything happened using the HTTP protocol. Uh, it could be also interesting uh, um, to, to mock uh, services that are integrated with, uh, I don't know, Asynchronous mechanism like the like a, a rabbit uh, messages and so on, or GPRC protocols. Uh, I don't know if uh, there is uh, any plans to add uh, such uh, methods. Um, so JPC we talked about before. Um, there's no plan to add it to WireMock as is today. It would be another package. Let's talk about message consumers for a second. Um, we make extensive usage of our RabbitMQ at through layer. Uh, in particular, the Rust uh, product is entirely event driven. So actually, at this point, I think we have three REST APIs and the rest are like 20 message consumers. Um, so we have an equivalent for message consumers um, that we use, um, which allows us to do a similar type of testing for message consumers. And so check if messages get published, uh, run the consumer in a black box and then check when it's done and similar things. But it relies on an in-house pub sub framework, which we wrote on top of LaFun, which is the um, MQP driver in the Rust ecosystem. Uh, if we open source that down the line, which looks like it's a possibility, um, then also the testing bits will be open source with it. Uh, so I'm gonna get to come again and show you the consumer stuff, which is actually very, very interesting. It's just that it's a more niche part of the ecosystem. Like everybody talks about web frameworks um, every single day, uh, but then nobody does message consuming at scale, or at least not as many people. Um, so the ecosystem maturing there is also a little bit lower. We found that also in terms of bugs and things to fix. 
so to say. Okay, thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, there isn't any other question, I will stop the recording now.